Good evening. This is a uh, special edition of Family Tree. We're filling in for Hamilton Cloud, who is away on a very big assignment. We did a program on the December the 15th where we had uh, some researchers who dealt with AIDS and also some researchers who dealt with the ancient belief systems. And tonight, we did promise that uh, we would uh, have those people back. However, uh, Zier's Miles, who is the AIDS researcher, uh, will not be here this evening. But uh, we feel that uh, what we're going to deal with uh, this evening will uh, shed some light on the ideology and the thinking behind people who would come up with a virus such as AIDS but in a much bigger context. We have as our guest uh, Jordan Maxwell, who is a writer, a teacher of ancient science, sciences and ancient belief systems. And we're going to be talking about uh, the impact historically in terms of world religions, religions, religious beliefs, and how they have been uh, propagated throughout history and the secret societies that were formed around these belief systems which still exist today and which play a big part in some of the behind the scenes actions that take place that the general public has no idea of what they're being impacted with by whom and from what ideology, what systems that comes from that. And it's going to shed some lights on Christianity, Judaism, and other world religions. And uh, so welcome to the program. Uh, we have uh, Jordan Maxwell. Thank you very much, Marcus, for allowing me to be here. And I also want to take the opportunity to thank KPFK for allowing me the opportunity to speak because in this particular time in which we're living, to be able to speak freely is going to be a very important in the very near future because our freedoms are very closely being watched and are being monitored and uh, there is the possibility we may lose the freedom of speech very soon and KPFK is an outstanding example of free speech and I'm happy to be here with them. Thank you. We certainly uh, appreciate that here at uh, KPFK and of course uh, to our listeners out there. Uh, want to remind our listeners to uh, support the KPFK and, uh, and within the next month we do have another fund drive so we want to see those phones light up uh, so that we have the can continue with the type of opportunities that we have with the kind of programming that we are able to uh, present here on li listener sponsored uh, radio station um, well uh, we can uh, begin into uh, the whole concept of uh, ancient belief systems and uh, you can start. Well, first of all, Marcus, I want to say that on this planet there are no passengers. We're all crew. So we all have a stake in what's happening in this world and whether we want to deal with it right now or not, we're going to be faced with what is going on in the world generally and especially right here in this town. H.G. Wells said that civilization is nothing more than a race between education and catastrophe and that's what we've got coming and looking at us as catastrophe from all corners of the world certainly from the standpoint of this new world order yes. that uh, <coughs> our illustrious president bush has uh, yeah, reminded has us of and helped bring to us <laughs> now you know the talmud said if there is no knowledge there is no understanding and if there's no understanding then there's no knowledge and that's what we have today a whole lot of no understanding and it's about time that people who do know speak up. Uh, and of course, President Wilson said, if you want to make enemies, just try and change something. So I know that anyone who tries to bring to the public the facts behind the world that we live in are going to be criticized and condemned or whatever. But there, are, I believe, and I'm sure KPFK believes that there's enough people in this world who want to know the truth and who are willing to stand 
and fight for it. And that's, again, I want to say I appreciate being here with you. Um, one of the main problems and tragedies in the world today is that those who, uh, that no one knows what it is that he doesn't know. And that it's um, usually the man that thinks he knows everything doesn't know anything. And one of the most important ways of learning today in our society is symbols and emblems. We see them on, uh, you know, used cars, and we see them on um, oil companies. We see them banks, emblems and symbols of companies and logos. Well, emblems are like words. If you can't read the emblems or symbols, then you don't know what the story is. And especially is that true in religion, because we're seeing so much of what we have said to be religion and in fact is nothing more than politics. Of course politics is religion and religion is politics because there's never been a religious movement on earth that wasn't a little political and there's never been a political movement on earth that didn't have a little religion in it. Tonight I'd like to focus on the religion that's prominent in our country and that's Christianity. Now before I get into this subject I want to say that I don't, I don't appreciate anyone putting me into a box or pigeonholing me and deciding who I am or where I'm coming from because if you don't know me, you don't know where I'm coming from. So I'm not a communist, I'm not a Nazi, I'm not a uh, racist, I'm, I'm just a human being with something to say. I belong to no particular political party. Consequently, I'm not coming from any particular place. I'm a researcher, a teacher. I enjoy what I do. I've been doing it for 32 years, and it's about time, I feel, to bring my work to the public and help other people to understand some of the things that they're seeing that they don't understand. Now, we, we see about, in this country, we see a lot on television of Christianity, and, uh, and we see presidents and congressmen and senators and everybody, all the, the, the civic leaders are all into Christianity and going to church and being fine people. And for being such fine people, we find out that they're not really fine. As a matter of fact, an honest politician anymore is one who does not take a bribe that he didn't earn. So our system is falling apart. It's collapsing all around us. And the reason why is it's built on lies. From perhaps one of the greatest lies or misconceptions, and let's be generous, maybe misunderstandings, is Christianity. And I feel that there's so much I would like to say tonight, but I would like to be able to deal with Christianity first and get that out of the way, because until such time as the people understand where Christianity came from, how it was arranged, and why it teaches what it does, you're not going to understand the mentality behind it. And we're talking about a white mentality. If we go back, say, 15 to 10, 15,000 years ago into the ancient world, and you understand that they didn't have all of the, the modern-day conveniences that we do, you know, the television to occupy our time and waste our lives for us, and they, don't, they didn't have the nice warm homes and cars and all the things that keep them occupied. It was a very hostile and un uh, an inhospitable world. It was filled with fear and coal and very difficult for human beings to live. It's especially in, in Europe. Oh, yes. Uh, well, all over Europe, but especially in Europe. But what was it that was said that the uh, adult would die at around 20 to 21 years old? You know, that was a very hostile world for the humans to live in. And we're talking again about 10 to 15,000 years ago. Now, it was perceived, obviously, from the beginning, according to the best that we have in history and the best that we can deduce from, from the ancient record, that the first enemy of man was darkness. That was the first thing that man realized that was frightening to him, and his world was just plain darkness. Because uh, l it was bad enough trying to live during the daytime, but when the sun went down, it gets scary because there were predator animals out there, <clears throat> there were enemies that lurking in the bush, and so nighttime became very fearful to our first men. Now, when you understand that kind of a world and understand those conditions, from there you begin to appreciate how they perceived the coming of that orb of day or the sun as being something wonderful to look You can appreciate to. why they would look forward to the coming of the sun or the coming of that great orb of day. Now, if you begin to 
uh, see how these philosophies would come into people's minds and begin to grow and, and people and children coming up would accept the same philosophies and ideas and promote them to their children and their children to their children. You begin to see how the philosophy of the war between light and darkness, that which was light was good, of course, because the light was always peaceful and it was good and that was, was dark was bad. And therefore, it was the basis for this animosity between the light and darkness. Okay, well, we've seen a lot of that because that's carried over into our society sociologically and the war between light and darkness, okay? But as I said, light was good and dark was bad. And the sun, of course, is the light of the world. And they understood that. The ancients were not stupid. They saw that the sun was not God. They never, they never believed that the sun was God, but they believed that it was the reproduction of God. It was the offspring of God. It was the most closest symbol that they could use to represent deity in heaven. So they figured that since your son looks a lot like you, well, maybe God looks a lot like the son, or the son looks a lot like the, the father, okay? So they realized that the son and I'm using this word sun as an Anglo-Saxon word today, the orb in the sky, whatever you want to call it, back then was understood to be the descendant of the Father, or the creator of the heavens. And so therefore they realized that this sun did not belong to anyone, it belonged to the heavens, so it belonged to God. So it was God's sun. And of course, in the, every morning it came up, it was in the sky or in heaven, so therefore God's sun was in heaven. And God's son being in heaven, uh, as I said, it was the son or the offspring of the father. Well, they said that no one has ever seen the father. No one can see God. But if the son looks like God, then maybe the son mimicked God. And so they said, so when you have seen the son, you've seen the father. Now, incidentally, it's interesting as to why the ancients believed that God was a father. Because in the most ancient world, they associated the creation of the humans and creation on earth with the mother. It was only until the coming of the early Roman Empire that the, that the uh, emphasis was then put on the male. Right, as, as contrast to the African. Yeah, absolutely. The African system was based on the female and even the Greeks when they borrowed everything from Africa. It was Pista Sophia, they said, which was feminine wisdom. And as I said, they, the ancient people knew that no one has ever seen God, no one can see God, but if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. And I was going to say the reason why the ancients uh, believed, and some of the uh, ancient people believed that God was a Father. And it's interesting because of rain. Rain was perceived to be the fluid from the Father that gives a life or brings life to Mother Earth. And so when Mother Earth is impregnated with the fluid from the Father in heaven, uh, then, you know, the Mother Earth gives birth to all life. So that's where the concept of God the Father comes from, from rain. And uh, in that area that we call today Israel was in its very ancient times called Cana. And those people there, Canaanites, celebrated the great... Um, marriage feast, so to speak, between God the Father and Mother Earth and all the life that the two of them produce for us. So they call this great celebration in the spring the marriage feast of Cana, where uh, God's son is asked by Mother Earth to draw water to uh, make it rain so the grapes can grow so we can have a, a wine feast and a, and, a, uh, and a feast which was called the marriage feast of Cana. That's where that comes from. And, of course, the sun gives life to us in that it gives us our energy. It causes, it gives energy to all living things. We eat those th living things, and, and we get energy. So, therefore, the, the sun is giving up its energy for us to live. So the ancients said that God's sun gives his life so that we may live. And the sun, of course, represented, because it's interesting if, the ancient Egyptians especially said that as long as the sun continues to come up in the morning, there's going to be life. There's obviously going to be life forever as long as that sun comes up. And so therefore the sun became the symbol of everlasting life on the earth, but not for you. 
but on the earth everlasting life. And, of course, God's Son is our Savior in that he is risen. Of course, the ancients said that the Son, as, much, as, as wonderful as it was, was not going to save anybody if it didn't come up in the morning. Uh, if, we, if it don't come up in the morning, as, as great as it was, we're dead. Therefore, he is our salvation. He is our Savior only if he is risen. And the Egyptians called that risen son in the morning Horus. Horus was God's son. That was a name they gave him in Egypt, Horus. And they said that in the morning all Egyptians would get up to see the sun come up and they're like an Easter sunrise service. And they would see the sun come up and he was rising. And so you go out to see Horus and he is risen. And that's why today even when the sun comes up, it comes up on the Horus Horizon or Horizon. And, of course, um, you had better thank the Father for sending his Son because he is your life and he's your, um, you know, he's your salvation. And, of course, the ancients uh, breathed a sigh of relief when they saw the Son come up because they became more secure in their world. To when they saw the Son come up, everything became clear and they could see all the animals and they weren't afraid of the dark anymore. So, consequently, the Son took on the, the position of being the Prince of Peace because everyone felt much better and peaceful when the sun came up. So he was then considered the Prince of Peace. Now, as we said, the sun in Egypt was called Horus when it rose in the morning. And that's where, incidentally, he had 12 segments of, uh, of lifespan in the daytime. So that's where we get the word hours. Hours comes from Horus. It's H-O-U-R-S uh, or H-O-R-U-S. And uh, so, therefore, the sun would come up on the horizon. And it's interesting, too, that the, in the Egyptian way of thinking, there was uh, a second sun. God had a second sun who was equal to the first but, not, but was bad. His name was Set or Set, S-A-T or S-E-T. And, of course, Set was the evil sun. He was dark, so that made him evil. And he would only come out as the prince of darkness, after dark. Well, of course, it got dark when the sun went down, and therefore Set came out like the bogeyman is going to get you, and he's uh, dark. Therefore, that made him bad. Okay, now you have the two brothers, Horus and Set. One was light and one was darkness. Now comes the original trinity in Egypt, which was the three uh, lifespans of the sun, or the three lifespans in life, which is the newborn, the mature, and the old and dying which was the original trinity. Horus was the beginning as the newborn. Then at 12 noon, the sun was high over the pyramid. There was no, uh, there was no shadow on the pyramid, so they knew it was 12 noon. Therefore, he was called, at that point, you couldn't go any higher in the sky, so he was called the Most High. So therefore, you have God's son, Horus, and then the Most High at 12 noon, and then at night, you have Set. And, and, uh, and from there, that was your original trinity. And, of course, it's taken all sorts of turns coming down through history. But this is the basis for what we call today Christianity. But if you don't understand that, and then you don't appreciate where the stories came from. And it has always amazed me how many people will understand Christianity but not understand that Christianity is nothing more than a retelling of the same age-old stories that have come down through time. As a matter of fact, the Bible is not called the greatest collection of facts ever assembled. It's called the greatest story ever told. And the reason why it's the greatest story ever told is because to do a little homework, you're going to find out it's the oldest story ever told. As a matter of fact, it's the only story ever told. It's called astrotheology. How many people will understand Christianity but not understand that Christianity is nothing more than a retelling of the same age-old stories that have come down through time? As a matter of fact, the Bible is not called the greatest collection of facts ever assembled. It's called the greatest story ever told. And the reason why it's the greatest story is because to do a little homework, you're going to find out it's the oldest story ever told. As a matter of fact, it's the only story ever told. It's called astrotheology, the study and the worship of the heavens. So anyway, the heavens, now if you go out at nighttime and look them at the sky, 
What are you looking at? So you're looking at the sky. What's another name for the sky? Another word for the sky is heaven. Well, that's where the sun's at. At 12 noon, the sun's high in heaven. So therefore, they said that God's son was in heaven. Of course, they never believed that when they died, they would go to heaven with God's son. I mean, at least they knew that much. But uh, at 12 noon, the sun was the most high. Consequently, they said that God's son was 12 when he was in God's temple. God's temple is, of course, the heavens, and at 12 noon, he's in the, he's in the temple. So that's why he was 12 when he was in the temple. And that since everlasting life came from God's son, the sun was round. It was a circle in the sky. So the ancients saw life as a round circle, an endless circle of life. Uh, pictured in the sun. So that was the way they kept time then, was on a round calendar. Today we call them like a uh, sundial or that kind of thing. That's where they came from, the round calendars. As a matter of fact, the Aztecs and the Mayas and the ancient uh, Mexicans kept the round sun calendars. Now the sun calendars were in Egypt were realm, and they were divided by 12 parts, just as all sun calendars are, 12 parts of 12 months. And each one of the months was called a helper to the sun because it helped the sun do his job on earth in that particular month. And later on, those, those particular months were called houses because as in the Babylonian scheme of things, they began to uh, develop what was called astrology so that each one of the months then became a house. And so therefore, the, the sun, God's sun, the light of the world, who is our salvation because he is risen, uh, had 12 helpers or 12 apostles, right? And then the sun also in, enters each one of those houses of the zodiac or each one of those constellations of the zodiac at the 30th degree. And it leaves at the 33rd degree. Therefore, they said that the sun begins his ministry at 30 and dies at 33. This is a very, very old. As a matter of fact, there are many books that that uh, trace at least 15 other major religions that have used the sun, God's sun as the light of the world, has used the sun uh, in the same context, in the same religious philosophy that was developed for the worship of God's sun. And there is at least 15 other major religions. And as a matter of fact, some, uh, one of the books right off the top of my head was uh, 16 Crucified Saviors by Percy Graves, a, a great book for that kind of a study. Um, there's just so much more I have in mind, but um, I'm wondering about the time here. Oh no, we're 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 doing okay. You okay, well, I, I'd like to keep going because uh, there's so many interesting little points that I I, I feel that's uh, valuable to bring out in relation to the subject of religion and the one that we're dealing with today. Okay, uh, at this point, uh, I think this is a good spot to take a brief uh, musical break and then we'll come back and uh, pick up on that because we're going to eventually lead into oh yes we're going to lead into some very controversial how, stuff how uh, this all at least is to white supremacy Welcome back to KPFK 90.7, listener-sponsored radio on your dial. This is your host, uh, Marcus Lewis, and a special edition of Family Tree, filling in for Hamilton Cloud and Spectrum, who's on a way on a big assignment. And we're speaking here with uh, Jordan Maxwell, who is a teacher in uh, ancient sciences, and we're dealing with the subject of the origins of Christianity, and we were just got into... Uh, the development of the uh, sundial and the, the calendars. And, of course, the Christianity has always labeled these ancient religions as being pagan, which gives a negative uh, connotation. Right. But uh, we can pick fact, up from uh, that. As a matter of fact, Marcus, the word pagan actually means someone who lives in the country, a, a, a mountain dweller or someone who lives outside of a city is a pagan. And and the, that, that name was given to... 
uh, people who lived up in the mountains because in Rome, when, when Christianity was adopted, uh, it, was, it was thought to be later, once it was fully developed, to be a sophisticated, since Caesar becomes a Christian, everybody could be a Christian now, and so therefore it became the state religion, therefore it was now in high style to be a Christian. Consequently, you would be very intelligent if you were a Christian. You were very in, you were modern if you were a Christian in Rome once it was accepted fully, and therefore it became the thing to be is a Christian. Now, of course, people out in the out on the hills, the farmers and the poor people out on the outside of, of Rome, that that have lived the same way for for ten thousand years. Well, those were pagans because they didn't understand the new understanding of things. So it was a disparaging uh, remark about poor people, people of the of the soil, people who were farmers, people who didn't know all of this high-fangled, new, fancy, new religious thing that Rome's come up with. Uh, they were just people, and the people were the poor working-class people, and they were called pagans. That's where the word came from. Anybody who wasn't in with the the in crowd in Rome with the new religion was a pagan. So we'll dispense with that word. Anyway, we're getting back to the uh, <coughs> excuse me. The sundial. The sundial was of course round because the sun was round, and uh, so they kept uh, they kept track of the months because it was divided into twelve equal parts. <coughs> excuse me. And while this might be, I want to say this. While this might be just dry um, religious philosophy being discussed, it has a motive at the end. And so I caution you don't to disregard this conversation too quickly because it's going to get very interesting soon. Uh, getting back to the sundial, the uh, the calendar was divided into 12 parts, the 12 equal parts of the 12 helpers of the sun, and that's where we get the 12 apostles of the sun. And, of course, they noticed something interesting. The ancient people were very observant, and not like us. We're too busy to observe anything. But uh, the ancient people had time to observe, and they found out something that it's interesting on the, in the winter, or what we call the winter solstice on December, on our December 22nd, the sun had kept moving. Each day the sun kept moving uh, a little small piece on the sundial. And you could tell the sun was moving each day by watching the sundial. And as the sun was moving further and further south, bringing on our winter, they would notice that it kept going further and further on the sundial until it stopped. And then they said, thank God the thing has stopped, because if it keeps going, it's going to be gone completely. Okay, So it stopped, and it stopped on December 22nd. And they noticed something, that for three days on the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th, every morning, it was still sitting in the same place. It had not moved any further and hadn't come back this way any. any. So they figured anything that don't move must be dead. So they said the sun must be dead. So, and then on the 25th, they noticed that it moved the opposite way, one degree, so that means the thing's alive now. So, therefore, December 25th was the sun's birthday. And that they said, but before that, uh, God's son had died and, and been dead for three days. Right. Of course, we just uh, had a big celebration on the son being born again Absolutely. on the 25th. Yes, Matter of fact, Christmas. I saw him today. Yeah, I saw him today. And uh, so when you take that round calendar now with 12 individual months or 12 helpers or apostles and you you divide that you divide the the um, now this is this is difficult to explain over the air but I'm trying if you divide the circle from the winter solstice which is the middle of winter down through extra, exact right through the circle and the bottom which would be the summer solstice then you uh, then you uh, with a cross on it and that's why today, almost all churches you will drive by, seeing the cross on the outside of churches, you'll see the cross with a circle on the cross. The circle is the sun that dies on the cross of the zodiac. On the calendar, the ancient calendar, you divide the winter and summer solstice from the autumn and spring equinox, there's a cross on the circle. And the circle is the sun dying on the cross. Okay? So we can dispense with that. Now, as we said, the sun was born on December 25th, and of course every year they said that the sun was born again. And of course now for you to be born again, that means that you have to go underwater to be born again. Why? 
uh, you know, you're baptized in underwater to be born again? No, that comes from the fact that when you were born the first time, your mother broke water. You were submerged in water the first time. So if you're going to be born again, you've got to go back under the water again. Nothing holy about it, just plain old life. The way philosophies came about is people just looked at the world around them, watched the way things worked, and had to get in line with it. They couldn't make the universe do what they want, so they got to get in line with it and form their religious philosophies or ideas with what was there. So the baptism had to do with the mother's water That's right. as opposed to the River Jordan. That's right, exactly. It had nothing to do with the River Jordan. Okay. Now, light was always, as we said, associated with truth, and the lie was always the work of darkness. Okay. And therefore, the sun was the light and the truth. And he brought the truth and the light. And as a matter of fact, uh, it is said of the Son that he was the truth and the light. And that's why, incidentally, we have in our jury, uh, jury system today in America, we have 12 jurors who help bring the truth to light. See? So, um, also about the winter time. It was interesting because in the winter, winter was always associated with death. And that's because everything in the winter dies. So, winter was associated with death. And, of course, the sun dies in winter. And uh, so they said, and this is a very important point, they said that the sun, when it was reborn on December 25th, which was God's son's birthday, uh, it had passed over, because we use that term today, when you pass on or you passed away or, or you passed over, uh, the sun had passed over from the death of winter to the coming new life of spring, so that in the spring he came back to life. And he brought life back to the earth. So he had passed over and passed on or passed away. And so the, in the ancient, ancient Egyptians had a celebration the first day of spring, and they called it the Passover. And they celebrated the Passover because the sun has done passed over from the death of winter to the new life of spring. That's where the Passover comes from. Anyway, uh, the sun, of course, in spring, first day of spring, all of a sudden everything that was dead, it now comes alive again. So therefore, God's son is bringing life back to the earth. He is a symbol of everlasting life. And as I said, for the earth, but not for you. And at that particular month that he comes back into, uh, into, the, into the spring was in the most ancient calendars was Virgo, Virgo the virgin. Therefore, it was said that God's son is born of a virgin. That's where that came from. God's Son feeds his followers, of course. We, we were told that God's Son feeds his followers with two fishes. Two fishes, of course, anybody that knows anything about astrology at all knows the two fishes are, is the symbol of the age of Pisces. Now, in the old age of Pisces, of the two fishes uh, is a little over 2,000 years in length. Now, if you understand that those 12 apostles were the 12 months of the year or the 12 days of uh, 12 hours of light, and the 12 hours of darkness, I mean, the 12 was very important. Uh, if you understand that each one of those apostles or months uh, was given to a particular astrological constellation, you know, the uh, Cancer and Sagittarius, etc., etc. Okay? So the old age of Pisces, or the fishes, when, when God's son feeds his people with two fishes, is a little over 2,000 years old uh, in length. Each one of the constellations is 2,000 years in length in the astrological scheme of things. And so the, uh, the, the uh, constellation of Pisces began about 2,000 years ago with the rule of Rome. And Rome is said to have ruled under the age of Pisces, the two fishes. And that's why that's where we get the idea that you know, the God's son fed people with the two fishes. And, of course, in, in, in context, uh, when we speak of Rome, we're talking about after the, the decline yes, of, of yeah, Egypt and, yeah. and the Rome is coming into power. That's right. So they take, you know, it's just like everybody else. Everybody borrows from everybody else. And we think we don't, but we do. I mean, we, we make movies. Uh, one guy has a great smashing movie, and four other people come out with a movie just like it. So everybody borrows from everybody else, and that's true of religion. The only problem is, is that who had the thing to start with is the problem. And all of this began in Egypt. And Egypt, we're talking about Africa, and Africa, we're talking about black. So let's go on. Now, if, if each one of those ages 
was about 2,000, a little over 2,000 years long, each one of the astrological constellational ages. And if the God's Son, uh, the light of the world, comes into the age of Pisces with the coming of the, of the rule of Rome, uh, that's why, of course, the Pope has the fish's hat, the fish's mitre. The hat of the Pope is actually the fish of Dagon or the, the fish god of the two fishes. And, of course, now we've been in that astrological period of time under which God's Son has ruled the world in the age of Pisces for uh, 1992 years, give or take. And since an age... Uh, eon in the Bible, eon or aeon, is about 2,000, a little over 2,000 years in length. That means we're 1,992 years into the age of Pisces. And the next age to come, of course, is the uh, age of Aquarius, if you look at any astrological chart. Therefore, if we're 1,992 years into the age of Pisces, and we're looking real close at coming into the age of Aquarius then we are living, what the Christians say, in the last days. That's right. We're living in the last days of the age of Pisces. Not the last days, the end of the world, the boogeyman is going to get you and the whole world is going to burn up a fire and all that stuff. It is the last days of Pisces. And therefore, the coming Messiah, or when he comes again, will come, he says in the uh, book of uh, Luke 22.10, when he's asked what you're going to come back as in the last Passover, and he says, go into the town and go into the house with the man with the water pitcher. So here is the sun symbolized in Pisces, and the rest of the uh, astrological signs of the 12 apostles are asking him, now what are you going to do next? Well, now that you've been the fisherman, now what's going to be next for us? When you get to the last Passover in the age of Pisces, now what you're going to do coming up. And he said, well, now we're going to go into the age of the man with the water pitcher. And that's Luke 22.10. He says, go into the town. You'll see a man with the, uh, with the water pitcher and go into that house. So we're talking about Aquarius now. Again, I have to say that the Bible is nothing more than astrology. It has always been astrology. It's just not known for astrology, and that's what we have to clarify. And of course, ministers on Sunday uh, never... Uh uh, point this out. As a matter of fact, uh, in Christianity, they denounce uh, astrology as being uh, evil. Yes, let me explain that to you. I'm glad you brought that up. The reason why today Christians say that astrology is evil and bad and of the devil, of course, devil is nothing more than adding the D to the word evil. You add evil and put a D in it, and there's you got the devil. And of course, God is nothing more than adding the O. You add an O to God. I mean, you, you take an O out of good, and you got God. So God is good, and the devil's evil. Of course, you add a D to evil, and it becomes evil. But the reason why, and I hate to bring this up again, but I just forgot the question, because <laughs> what was the point you had just made about? About uh, the evilness of uh, the astrology. Oh, yeah. Okay, the now, the reason why uh, Christianity sees that astrology is evil is very simple. In the Old Testament, Moses... Uh, says to God's people to have nothing to do with the astrologers, nothing to do with those who can foretell the future by the stars and all of that. That's all evil, bad stuff. Has nothing to do with it. And so, therefore, we would be followers, uh, footstep followers of the Messiah and, and, and coming down through that line, so we wouldn't want to have nothing to do with it either if Moses didn't. And Moses said, don't have anything to do with them people. Read them stars, okay? Now, the understanding of that is this, and listen closely, because it's so simple. In the Old Testament, there are four separate and distinct gods. In the gods. Old Testament, there are four separate and distinct gods being discussed. And there are is at least 25 pounds of, of information at UCLA alone, much less USC, Berkeley, and every other uh, university in this country. There were four separate gods, distinct from each other, being talked about in the Old Testament. But we don't know that because the priesthoods who put that Old Testament together, and you weren't there, so you don't know. But those people who put that Old Testament together knew that there were four different gods, four different deities. One was, one of the deities was 
the sun, of course, Solar, that's where we get Sol, Om, An, uh, King Sol, Om, An, or Sol, Om, and An, Sol, of course, being Latin for the sun, Om is uh, Hindu for the sun, the Om, and An was the city of the sun in, in Egypt. So one of, the, one of the gods in the Old Testament was the sun, one was the Stellar cult, the old ancient Hebrew Stellar cult who connected themselves with God through the stars. Then there was the moon cult or the lunar cult of which Moses was the leader of the lunar cult. So now you have a lunar cult, you have the stellar cult, you have the, uh, the solar cult. And incidentally, that's why Moses, being the lunar, uh, the leader of the lunar cult, uh, Hebrew Yahweh Jehovah was the lunar god. Uh, the, the god of the moon at that time, in the time of Moses. He, uh, he was El before that in the ancient Semitic, and that goes into these, the planet Saturn. We'll get into that too. But, but Moses being a lunar, a worshiper of the lunar god, El or Jehovah, naturally would not want to have, would not want to have anything to do with the other group across the street or down the block, you know, the, the, the other group down the block who worship a different god, they worship in the stars. So that's why he would tell his followers they have nothing to do with the star worshipers because we are moon worshipers over here. And that's why, of course, after sundown is when the moon comes out. That's why he would have all the holy days after sundown because that's when his God, the moon, came out. So he'd have all the celebrations after sundown. So incidentally, one of the main reasons why the lunar or the moon was a was a worshipped by the old ancient uh, followers of uh, Moses is because the moon uh, had control over the woman's menstrual cycle. The, the, the they believed that the woman's menstrual cycle was set by the the symbols of the moon, and and since uh, they were into sex worship, that was one of the primary uh, factors in the old lunar cult was sex worship. I mean, that's why they had circumcision. Now, what is, uh, what is cutting the foreskin off of a boy's penis got to do with the holiness of the Lord? It don't have a thing to do with the holiness of the Lord. It's got to do with sex. That's why you're messing around with the boy's penis is because it has to do with sex. And the reason why they, they circumcise is because they found out a man will get uh, aroused quicker uh, without the foreskin than he will with the foreskin. So since that's what we are into here, a little sex and a little uh, menstrual cycle and all that, uh, therefore, we uh, we practice circumcision, but that was not new with the Hebrews. That was that it goes way back into the Stone Ages. I mean, the very earliest Egyptians also did the same thing: circumcise the young males, preparing them for a little sex worship. So uh, let's go on from there. Or what's the, uh, we're do doing we have fine. Time? No, okay, yes, let's keep going. Okay, so um, anyway, there, there's oh, so then. We now are faced with the new scripture, a scripture in the, uh, in the Christian context is saying that Jesus, or God's Son, says that uh, in my Father's house are many mansions. Now the problem with that is that's not exactly what the Bible says. The King James mistranslated a lot, and you have to understand why. Because the old, uh, the old British, Anglo-Saxon British, were not that keen on old Hebrew and, and Greek. So they did the best they could, but they mistranslated a lot. And, of course, scholars today know that. But that scripture, in my father's house are many mansions, is mistranslated. It originally said, it originally said that in my father's abode are many houses. Oh, well, sure, there's at least 12 we know of, right? The houses of the zodiac. So in my father's abode, the heavens, are many houses. That's what God's son was saying. The King James was a wonderful man, I know. But his lackeys just didn't know Hebrew and Greek well enough to translate things correctly. And um, let's see. Now, later on, we see that the son is betrayed. Of course, he's betrayed in the fall by Judas or Scorpio. Scorpio being November uh, or in the fall of the year, I should say. And that's when the uh, rays are cut short. I mean, Saul Oman or Samson's ray, uh, his hair is cut short cause, uh, because the... Uh, the uh, sun's rays are cut short in the winter, and so he dies. And so what we're talking about again is astrology. Okay, now, if you want to, uh, let's see, if you, we need to go back into the ancient world for the understanding 
of all the modern day concepts again as I said for Christianity and understand that the Bible is the greatest story ever told in that it is the only story ever told now uh, let's see, the one we talk about, the light of truth, and we brought that out, and I'm going to bring that out again, because truth was always associated with light, and therefore anything that was uh, good was in the light, and if you did something bad, well, that was the works of darkness. And uh, interesting, too, is that the light was also, and is even so today, light is always associated with, um, with telling the truth about something. And if you, have, if you have good knowledge on a particular subject, then people say, well, you're brilliant. You're in the light. You're enlightened. Uh, and therefore, if you, as the ancients said, the ancient Egyptians said that if you, uh, in your mind, you put the truth out of your mind, when someone gives you the truth and is showing you the truth and you don't want to hear it, you put it out of your mind, what you're doing is you're killing the light of truth. And where are you killing the God's Son, the light of truth, the light in the truth? You're killing it in your head, in your brain. That's where you're put, shutting off the light of truth is in your mind. And therefore they said that God's Son was killed and put to death on Golgotha, skull place. That's where your brain is, is in your skull. Skull place is where you put the truth and the light to death. So um, the light, of course, God's light has always been impaled between two thieves. That's uh, regret for the past and fear of the future. We've always, you know, uh, put the death of light, put to death light and hope for tomorrow uh, between the two thieves, as I said. Uh, the sun, of course, has been used, and you know this, the sun has been used by kings and rulers and potentates and every kind of uh, rulers and, and institutions and everybody else, and their flags and emblems and symbols, police badges, I mean, everywhere. The sun is just used everywhere and as awards, you know, they give you sun, sun bursts and sundials and all that. So the sun has been used by everybody. That's why it's called King of Kings and Lord of Lords, because everybody uses it. The son also is said to have died with a crown of thorns. Well, of course the son dies with a crown of thorns. Now, all you're going to do is fly over New York and see the Statue of Liberty with a crown of thorns. Because the crown of thorns is nothing more than the sun rays. So when the sun's dying in the evening, you go out to the ocean, you see the sun walking on water. Yeah, he walked on water. And when you go out and see him walking on water, and what do you see? You see the, the sun rays. He dies with a crown of thorns. Uh, I brought also that... Um, they said, too, that God's son, the way he left is the way he's coming back, on a cloud. Well, of course, that's the way the son usually leaves, on a cloud. You, normally in the morning, for some clouds, he comes up on a cloud. So that's the way he left, was on a cloud, and that's the way he's going to come back on a cloud. And every eye will see him. Well, you've got to be dead or blind not to see the son. Every eye is going to see him. Of course, every eye is going to see God's son when he comes back. I mean, tomorrow morning. And, of course, uh, as I said, at 12 noon or 12, he's in God's temple and, uh, and taking care of God's business. Uh, then there's a story about God's son, as I said, walking on water. And then, of course, when during the storm, during that great storm in the Bible, it talked about the great tempest. And, 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 and the God's son was sleeping. And the storm was so bad, the Bible says the storm was so bad that the men on the ship were so frightened the, the, the seasoned sailors wanted to die. They just wanted to commit suicide because they just knew they were going to die. It was so rough. And, mm -hmm. and the God's son is downstairs sleeping. And everybody else on the boat is going to die. They're, they're so frightened to death. It's such a bad storm. And he's sleeping. Now, I've heard of people who soundly sleep, but that is something else. A man sleep right on through a storm and don't even hear it. Okay? Until you understand that the sun does control weather. It controls the storms on the sea, and so the, the ancients knew that. They knew that the sun controls the seas. So um, I think I'm coming to an end on Christianity a little bit. Okay. I got about another four hours, but I'm going <laughs> to cut it down a little bit. Okay. Uh, we've uh, been talking uh, to uh, Jordan Maxwell, and uh, we decided to open this way to give a background to show the uh, astral theology or astrological aspects of the Bible taken from the ancient texts, uh, Egypt uh, in particular, and uh, how this has developed. And of course, we're going to uh, go into how this developed into uh, uh, a political 
ideology and uh, lead into some of the uh, supremacist uh, uh, views and, and values and uh, of course the associations around uh, secret societies uh, but uh, before we do that we'll, we'll go to a uh, we'll take a little musical break This is Marcus Lewis, host of Family Tree. We're, we're filling in for uh, Hamilton Cloud, who's away on uh, assignment, and our guest is uh, Jordan Maxwell. And we're dealing with uh, ancient uh, belief systems, and uh, we're focusing in on uh, Christianity. And uh, we will uh, pick up where we left off. We we had. Were well, you going to finish yeah, the just Christianity a few more segment? Points I wanted to bring out. Yeah. Uh, one in particular is in relation to the other uh, symbols, like the, uh, the the two fishes, which is uh, Pisces, of course, and then uh, the the age that's coming up uh, after the year 2000, and that's why we're in the last days. We're in the last days, you know, the last days of Pisces. That's all. It's just that it's just that simple. Coming of the end of the age. Coming the end of the end of the age, and that's why we're going to have a new age. And it's oh, there it is, there it is. Of course, they that's changed that age to world. Oh, okay. In the in the, in the mistranslation. Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, like all mistranslations, uh, this one uh, was purposely mistranslated. But uh, you see, I believe there's going to be a new age, but I I don't think it's going to be the one that they've been planning for us. I think there's someone higher than the high one looking on, and there's going to be a new way of doing things, and it ain't going to include the kind of uh, manipulation, usury, exploitation. And the kind of stuff that's been coming down for the last 2,000 years, we can't afford another 2,000 years of this stuff. We've got to clean this up. So anyway, I wanted to bring out that uh, a couple of the other symbols of the 2,000-year uh, periods before Pisces, uh, of course, was uh, the age of Aries, the ram. And, of course, that's why the Hebrews blew the ram's horn at the beginning of the year. For the ram's horn was Aries, the ram. And, of course, out of that, Christianity deduces the ram or the lamb, the lamb of God. Well, in the old Hebrew, they put to death a, a lamb because it was called the paschal lamb or the symbol of the age under, uh, under uh, Aries, the paschal lamb, ram. And then, of course, uh, the bull, when they, when they were worshiping the golden calf, of course they worshiped the golden calf because the golden was the sun and the calf was Taurus the bull. So the golden calf was Taurus the bull or the sun in the astrological symbol of Taurus. And, of course, the concept of the judgment day, when everybody's going to be brought back up and going to be judged, you know, in the judgment day. That's Egyptian, and that's just a story. Uh, it's one more than the other stories, but it's just a story. There ain't no such a thing as a judgment day unless you understand what the Egyptians were saying. And the Egyptians were saying that the day that you are living right now is your judgment day. Because we are finding out what you are like. And you're being judged right now. And, of course, if you understand that, then you can go on and not have to worry yourself sick over what's going to happen to you when you die. Because for sure, you're not going up to heaven with God's Son. I mean, you, I don't know where you're going, but you're not going up there with God's sun. Now, the idea that hell was hot comes from the idea or the concept that the sun, the, in, in, in Egypt, the sun is a lot hotter than it is in this country. In Egypt, it is hot what is hot. And so they realize that anything that's that hot, when it goes down at night, it must be hot as it's going through the earth. So if you die and you go into the earth, it must be hot. And, of course, volcanoes will blow up hot stuff. So that proved it right there. See, the, the earth is hot. So if you go into hell and you die, you go to hell, and it's hot. Actually, the word hell, H-E-L, is a Nordic Scandinavian word, and it was spelled H-E-L. And so they realize that anything that's that hot, when it goes down at night, it must be hot as it's going through the earth. So if you die and you go into the earth, it must be hot. And, of course, volcanoes will blow up hot stuff, so that proved it right there. See, the, the earth is hot. So if you go into hell and you die, you go to hell, and it's hot. Actually, the word hell, H-E-L, is a Nordic Scandinavian word, and it was spelled H-E-L, not H-E-L-L, H-E-L, -L, hell, which meant a place where you bury something. If you bury something in a hole and you cover it up, that's hell, H-E-L, in the Scandinavian tongue. 
Therefore, if you put a, uh, in wartime, you put something over to cover your head, that's a hell meant. Because that's what hell meant, was covering something up. Okay? Uh, let's go on, though. I want to get back to the word blessing. And everybody's looking for a blessing. Well, the word blessing comes from the word blood, B-L-O-D, or blood, B-L-O-E-D-S-I-A-N. It's an old English Welsh word, blessing or blood, which means the shedding of blood. Anytime there's bloodletting or killing or shedding of blood, it was a blessing. And that's why in the Crusades, they just couldn't wait to get back and tell the Pope that they had killed all them people because that was a wonderful blessing because they had shed a lot of blood. And that's why, of course, it goes back to the old ancient world, way far before uh, Israel, when the animals would be sacrificed and uh, you would have to pour out the blood. And that was a blessing. As a matter of fact, the earth today is being blessed all over the world today. There's more bloodshed in the name of religion in Ireland and, and, uh, and the Middle East and here in America and downtown L.A., I mean, there is, there is nothing but bloodshed all over the world. So we are totally being blessed all over the world with bloodshed. And I just happen to think that it's, a, it's an idea whose time has come to, to get rid of this blessing and go back to school and get an education and find out that you've been took. Anyway, Christians would tell you that they are bathed in the blood of the Lamb. Now, nothing could be more repulsive to me than to be bathed in the blood of the Lamb. But that's exactly what the high priest in the ancient Israel and the ancient Hebrew uh, uh, religious philosophies would do is that they would cut the heads off and drain the blood and then they would take the blood and sprinkle the blood on, on the sacrifice and then sprinkle it on the people and they sprinkle it on themselves and that is very holy until you start to think about what does it look like an old man with blood all over him you know that 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 just does not bring up into my mind holiness that sounds like animal sacrifice and and cruelty to animals and, of course, we got all bent out of shape if you find someday uh, you will drive along the street and see some animal with his head cut off and drained his blood out in the street, and people just think that's terrible. Well, that's what they did in the Bible. They were just cutting the heads off the animals and draining blood. That was a blessing. And that's because we don't know what these words mean. We need to define the terms and go back to school and, and educate ourselves as to where religion comes from. Now, again, I'm going to say, I don't want anyone putting me in a box as to determine as to who I am and where I'm coming from. I am an academic. I'm a teacher. I'm not a radical. I'm not trying to uh, put down religion. I am not trying to uh, in any way offend anyone. I am trying to get to the bottom. And that, incidentally, that's what the word radical means, one who gets to the bottom of things. So if that is what I'm doing, and, and if I'm a radical, well, then I'll, I'll take that, and I'll, I'll be happy. <laughs> we're all radicals yeah, here and we're KPFK. all radicals here. Okay. Now, uh, today, let's see. Um, yeah, oh, incidentally. Now, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the Mass in, in Christianity is, of course, the celebrating of uh, Christ's blood and his, and his body that was shed. Well, then... The, Eating of the body of the God is a very old, ancient uh, concept. Uh, some of the most ancient cultures in the world would, would worship a God and then cut him up and eat him. And as a matter of fact, <coughs> excuse me, Baal, in the, uh, Semitic, uh, in the ancient Semitic scheme of things, Baal, I should say Ugaritic or Syrian area of the world, um, Baal was a God, and, and they, would, uh, they would bake a cake to Baal, they cut it all up, and then at the end of the service, they'd eat it. And then later on, they, got, they, they, they liked that so much that they started eating each other. And therefore, uh, that's where we get the word canna bale, because the people of Cana would eat the flesh of bale, canna bale. Um, then but I wanted to say this about the, the concept of, of eating the blood and, uh, and drinking the blood and eating the flesh of the God. That sounds very holy until you think about what must that look like, and what does that sound like? And like Dick Gregory said, if you, if you went home one night and saw your children drinking wine and having a bread and having some kind of a feast, and you asked them, what are they doing? They said, well, we're just eating your blood, drinking your blood and eating your, your, your flesh. And you say, My, that sounds sick. You know, what are them kids doing? Well, that's what these people are doing. They're eating the, the, their God's blood and of course, these are flesh. these are the sacraments that the the sacrament ceremonies that, uh, right. that are doing that are, that today are in, in the to. churches. Absolutely. 
So <clears throat> basically, I should, you know, basically what I'm saying is that defenders of Christianity are called apologists. And boy, Christianity has got a lot to apologize for. There's no doubt about that. But allegiance to old myths, it was said by an ancient philosopher, uh, allegiance to an old myth never broke a chain or freed a human mind. So I know that it is true that most people want to hear what they want to hear. They don't want to hear what they don't want to hear. But somewhere along the line, we're going to have to find out and we're going to have to deal with the reality that we're in today because nobody is leaving this country. Blacks are not leaving the country to go back to Africa. And white folks are not going to even go back to England. As a matter of fact, nobody is going to leave this country. More people are coming here than leaving. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to figure out what the problems are and be straight with each other. We're going to have to talk straight with each other and be honest and let's get to the bottom of it. And, and find out where racism comes from, where bigotry comes from, where ignorance comes from, and where this whole idea of dark and black being bad and the uh, prince of darkness. And, of course, uh, the sun coming up in the morning is the prince of light. And so that's where we get that old context of light and darkness. But uh, over and above that, <coughs> excuse me, I mentioned before that we had um, four gods in the Old Testament. I want to throw in something, too, and this is a freebie. There is a lot of good academic uh, material coming out right now in universities throughout the world, not just in this country, but some very good academics are coming out investigating the writing of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And a lot of uh, people are looking at the possibility that the uh, Pentateuch, those first five books of the Bible, were written by women. Now, boy, if we can prove that, that's going to set everybody back about three years' growth. So I, I wasn't there. I don't know. But I'm just saying that there's some very good academics being uh, developed right now and some, and some good material on that subject. And so that is at least a possibility. We cannot discount anything. I mentioned before that there were four gods. And, of course, some people have said, well, wait a minute. You only talked about three. Well, I'm going to go back over the four again. There was the stellar which were the, the old Semitic cult, the Stellar cult, who worshiped God through the stars. And, of course, they were bad. We don't have nothing to do with them because those are astrologers. Then there's the lunar god, which was on the Moses. And that's why Moses, incidentally, uh, Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo, I forgot. I think it's Michelangelo who, no, could have been, could have been either Vinci, one, yeah. uh, that, that, that did the, uh, the famous sculptor of, of Moses. And he has the horns, the horns on Moses. Well, those horns were called the lunar horns, and and the Vatican knows that, but they're just not telling you because uh, Moses was the worshiper of, worshiper of the lunar god. Uh, there, so, therefore, there was a stellar god, the lunar god, and the solar god, or God's sun. And then, of course, we had Saturn. Now, there's a very interesting fourth god that is, is kind of hidden in the scriptures, but the more you get into the Old Testament and check out the words and the, and the, and the, the phrases, you begin to see the words have to do with Saturn. And of course, that's why today, when you, uh, when you get married, you get married with a ring, because you're getting married before God, and therefore the symbol of that God is the ring, the ring of Saturn. You're wearing get married, you get married with a ring because you're getting married before God, and therefore the symbol of that God is the ring, the ring of Saturn. You're wearing the God's, God's ring. And of course the yarmulke was the round ring that you wear on your head, Saturn, your God, and that's why even the monks in the Middle Ages, <clears throat> in the Middle Ages, in the, in the, uh, in the temples, uh, Catholic monks would, would shave their head in a round circle, and the Hebrews would of course wear the yarmulke instead. But it all had to do with the realm. And, of course, kings would always wear a round crown of thorns. And the thorns were then turned in and became uh, the king's crown. And, of course, that's why today kings rule by divine right. Uh, why? Well, because the Lord 
ruled, that he was king of kings and lord of lords, so therefore, since I'm white folks, I can rule too. See? And I'm the king, and you not. And so now that's the basis for tyranny. So anyway, let's get back to Saturn. Saturn was always pictured, uh, Saturn's color was black, incidentally. And the ancients assigned black to Saturn for, what, for whatever reason. And um, the symbol for Saturn was interesting. It was a sickle, like the Russian sickle, with on the tip of the sickle was a cross. And if you go to the library today, you will see that the, astronom the astronomical symbol for the planet Saturn was a sickle with the cross on top. And that meant that the cross overcomes the sickle. I think that's interesting. But uh, to get back to Saturn, the being the old ancient god, El, the, he was called the Ugaritic god or the Syrian Ugaritic god, which is what we call today Palestine. And, um, and that northern area of Palestine was, was uh, Syria. <coughs> that god's name was El. Now, in that area we call the Middle East today was totally absolutely totally under the influence of a more ancient empire Egypt in Egypt one of the original divinities was Isis Isis was a male female progenitor of knowledge and wisdom etc etc and so it was always a pictured as a mother holding a, a child which is Mary holding the, the, the child and incidentally that's where we get the uh, you know Mary had a little lamb things because Mary had a little lamb called Jesus you know it's snow white and the seven dwarfs was was Israel being white as snow in the seven congregations of Asia so that's where all those little nursery rhymes come from but anyway Saturn being L uh, was under the domination of Egypt because that whole area is its, its philosophies its ideas and its people have been so uh, dominated by Egypt so Isis was the first main divinity. Now, with the coming of Akhenaten, or Akhenaten, um, the worship was then changed to the worship of Amun-Re, or Amun-Ra, spelled A-M-E-N hyphen R-A, which is where we get, of course, Sun Ray from Amun-Re, okay? And uh, Amen Ra was worshipped in the temples as God's son, and at the end of the at the end of the, the, the services, they would say Amen because they were sending the prayer to God through Amen Ray, God's son. So they'd say Amen when they send the, the, the you know the prayer through God's son, because the ancients said that the ancient Egyptians said nobody's seen God, and ain't nobody ever seen God, and perhaps ain't nobody ever going to see God. But if you've seen the son, you've seen the Father. So when you pray to the Father, you pray directly to the Father, but you send your prayer through God's Son, Amen, Ray, and at the end of the prayer, you say Amen. Yeah, the, the personal Savior. That's right. So um, anyway, the, 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 uh, the symbol that was used uh, um, in the religious context for Saturn was the square. A square, a square box, a square. And it was black, and that's why, incidentally, Mecca is a square black box. Mecca, the, the, the great home of Islam, is a square because it has to do with the symbol of Saturn, Saturn's square. And it was colored black. And it has nothing to do with black because the Negro has to, has to do with black as a signed color to that particular planet. And, of course, um, when we get into, well, this is, uh, this is the interesting point, I think, is that Central Africa was blessed with a lot of rain. And, of course, uh, lower Africa, which was North Africa, had just about no rain. About no rain. So, that was, so that was a desert out there, and Central Africa was very high. The highlands would get lots of rain. So in the spring, when the rains would come, the waters would flow both southward into South, into, uh, into, um, South Africa or into North, into North Africa, which, as I said, is a desert. And it would begin to fill up the tributaries, and all the rains were flowing into Egypt. And once a year, the uh, the Nile would overflow because it couldn't deal with that kind of uh, with that volume of water. So once a year, there would be a great flood coming in Egypt, and it was always referred to as the waters of chaos. It was a terrible, terrible time of destruction. Well, of course, a flood is a terrible destruction, but along with that terrible destruction also came new life because if that water don't come in nothing's going to grow and you think it's dead now wait till the wait till there's no rain and no and no nile then you're really going to be dead 
So therefore, when the, when the waters of chaos and destruction came and destroyed the world, Egypt, once the waters receded, had deposited you know, uh, minerals and all of the life that would then be the basis for a, a new life in Egypt. So they said that Egypt, like you and me, was born again, came out from under the water and was born again. And they call that celebration. They had a celebration of the coming of, great, the, coming of the great flood. And the symbol of that celebration was a quarter moon like a little boat. It was mm -hmm. like a little boat or a little a canoe, and it was a quarter moon, the lower quarter of the moon. And that lower quarter of the moon in Egypt was called the word Akanoa. The Akanoa was the lower quarter of the moon when the rains came, the monsoon rains. And, of course, that's where we get the Ark of Noah. But it's actually the Egyptian Akanoa was the wet moon. And uh, Noah's Ark. Yeah, Noah's <laughs> Ark, right. And um, then when you get into Saturn, as I said, now, when you understand that Saturn's color was black, that he was a god of, the, uh, of one of the many different uh, Semitic tribes or, or groups, um, and of course, as I said, in his, in his, one of his symbols was, was a square, then you get into the square black mortarboard that the, that the university or the high school student wears on his head when he graduates the square. He wears the square on his head, and it's always black, okay? In most cases, it's always, in most cases, it's black. Uh, the priests wear long black robes, like judges. Now we're getting into politics because of Saturn, the old ancient Hebrew god, a one of the old ancient Hebrew gods. Therefore, the black robe that you wear when you are, are graduating is the same black robe that the judge wears when he's going to throw you in jail. Because the black represents Saturn, Saturn's the old Semitic god, okay? As a matter of fact, that's why today in churches, churches and courtrooms look the same. Because when you go into a church, you sit out here with the poor folks in, 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 the, in the chairs out here in the pews, but you can't go up onto the, uh, the lifted uh, higher elevation. You can't go inside the gate that has the little, uh, the little doors. You can't go inside there. Only the priest can go inside there and officiate for you. You stay on the outside with the poor folk, with the poor folks, okay? And the and the the altar is always raised at least three tiers, because in Egypt that's the way it was done. It was always the altar was raised so that the people could see uh, the representative of God dressed in black. So therefore, and the priest comes out on the altar dressed in black, and he is officiating for God for you. He is the mediator between you and God, and that's the same thing that happens in a courtroom. You walk in, and you're, you're the poor folks sitting out here in the audience, and there's the, the fence and the little gate, and the attorneys can go in, and they are your mouthpiece. They will talk to God for you. They're going to go talk to God and see if they can get you off, and he will be, he will be the mediator between God and man. That's where all of this comes from, and that's a matter of fact, that's where we get the word sheriff. It comes from the word sharif, like Omar Sharif. The word sheriff was the lawgiver in the ancient world of the e ancient Egyptians, and his symbol was the six-pointed the, uh, six star, or the Star of David. And that's why today the sheriff's got a six-pointed star, the Star of David. And now when you get into all of that, now you're opening up a whole new uh, realm of thought because now our symbols on the streets begin to take on special meaning when you understand they come from the old ancient Bible. And when you find out the people who are behind the old ancient Bible, and now you begin to... Do, to begin to see how these symbols all connect, like the uh, shell sign for the shell oil, and the uh, arco, arco, and you the, is a square, as I like, and the arco is looking down on the pyramid that has no capstone. <clears throat> and I should explain that because in the Bible, the the twelve apostles. Let me let me explain the thing on arco. In the Bible, the twelve apostles are are called the twelve cornerstones of the of the church the 12 cornerstones and Jesus is referred to as the chief cornerstone that the builders rejected three different times in the New Testament Jesus is referred to as the chief cornerstone now the chief cornerstone is a Greek word which means the peak of a pyramid the tip of a pyramid at the top is the chief cornerstone so therefore Jesus is the chief cornerstone the builders rejected well, the chief cornerstone on the pyramid is the all-seeing eye of Horus, or God's son, the eye. And that's why on the back of the dollar bill you have the pyramid with the chief cornerstone. 
And the I in the middle, of course, is Iusus or Jesus, or Jesus, the I, the I of God, or the sun, God's sun, the light of the world. It's all nothing more than astrology and mysticism. But now we're getting into secret societies, for instance, Freemasonry, occult Freemasonry. We're getting into Scottish Rite Freemasonry, occult Freemasonry of the ancient East, the Assassins, the Knights Templars of the Middle Ages. And then when you get into that, now you've got to talk about Steven Spielberg's uh, uh, Raiders, Raiders of the, the Lost, Lost Ark. Ark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, they're reading the Lost Ark. But if you go to the... If you go to the encyclopedia, or if you go to any uh, library and get Smith's Bible Dictionary, page 23, under the heading of Ark, you will see a, a, a beautiful Ark in Smith's Bible Dictionary, page 23. And it says the Ark is the Egyptian Ark. It was made in Egypt. It was purely an Egyptian idea, and it was an Egyptian Ark. Now you can understand why in Steven Spielberg's movie, uh, Anglo-American white folks are looking for the lost ark with the Nazis, they are also looking for it, but that's Europe, see, because Europe is the old world. So Europe's also looking for the lost ark. And where are the two of those people looking at, Hitler and Indiana Jones? They're looking in Egypt. They're not looking at, in, 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 uh, in Israel. They're not looking in Jerusalem. They're looking in Egypt, because that's where it came from. And they know. See, but they haven't told you that. Now, it's true that there is something to this idea of the lost ark and the holy grail. And, of course, if you understand that, you cannot understand Steven Spielberg's movie of the lost ark. Or the next one, uh, which is the, uh, the Empire Strikes Back. You can't understand that one. And you sure can't understand the last one of, of uh, what was it? The well, last the Indiana, Indiana, Indiana and, the, and the, the Temple Crusade. of Doom. No. Uh, the middle one, and then the last one, right. uh, Indiana's the, uh, the Last Crusade. The Last Crusade. Right. Now, what I was going to say is you cannot understand the Last Crusade unless you understand what the First Crusade was about. Because if you don't understand the First Crusade in the Middle Ages, you're not going to understand what the Last Crusade is. Because it's the same crusade. And it's been going on for a long time, and that crusade is very simple. And I'm going to explain it to you real simple. It is between some very powerful secret societies in the world that make the mafia look like Sunday school. Some very powerful criminal secret societies in this world that would just scare you to death, even just knowing about them. And they are at work today in our world, and they are battling for the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail was a cup, and according to the ancient world, the cup was the earth. The cup is the earth of life. It holds all the life and all the blood. So the, any, the blood on earth is in the Holy Grail. So whoever controls the earth controls the Holy Grail, controls all the blood. So therefore, it's the Holy Blood is in the Holy Grail. Now, that goes back to this old idea about the shedding of the blood. Now, why are we going to shed the blood? Well, we're going to shed the blood to gain control. See? And that will be our blessing. That's right. And that's going to be your blessing. And You're going to get blessed. And the Holy... The cup is the earth. Is the earth. And the blood is you. Now we understand what they mean by new world order. That's right. Okay. Okay. We got that straight. We got that straight. Now, once we understand that there are some very powerful secret societies in the world that you have never heard of, because any time you hear of anything going on in this world, you can rest assured that it's not important, because if you heard about it, it ain't important. It's what you haven't heard about that's going to scare you. And so now we're getting into something. You know, I know that we're running a little short on time. No, here. that would be a good spot to take a break, and then uh, we will uh, go into this aspect of, of this discussion. Like I said, we had to take you through that in order to get to this point. Yeah, so we'll, we'll take a break. And welcome back to our program. This is your host, uh, Marcus Lewis, and this is a special edition of uh, Family Tree 
We're filling in for Hamilton Cloud and Spectrum. Hamilton is away on a special assignment. We are continuing our discussion with uh, Jordan Maxwell, who is uh, with uh, International Research and Educational Society. Society correct. And uh, I want to remind our listeners that you're listening to 90.7 KPFK, Los Angeles, listener-sponsored radio. And where we ended on our last musical break, we were just getting into secret societies and the whole link-up to the ancient uh, religious symbology, but now we've carried on into this uh, development of the, the ideology of behind these secret societies. Right. Now, before I do that, I, I, I have a little something here from my feminist friends. Uh, churches, when the, almost all churches you will go to will always have a uh, pointed arch, and of course the windows, the stained glass windows, they're always pointed, and the pointed arch of a door, right? Now the pointed arch is because the female, that's the female womb, the pointed arch, and that's why for thousands of years, a couple thousand years now, uh, Christian priests have always been officiating and been in charge in a church, and they don't want women priests because it don't look right for a woman being in a woman. It has to do with sex, and the, that's why the pointed uh, the pointed door on the church is the is the pointed arch of the female, and the man who was uh, they said to be dominating or ruling over or commanding over the pointed arch, he enters into the pointed arch, and at that point is referred to in the ancient Hebrew as the holy of holies. The holy of holies was always considered to be the womb, the uh, the arch, the holy arch, and that's where life uh, comes from, and that's as close to God as you're going to get. And so, therefore, in the sex act was considered to be the closest thing that man and, and woman come to God, okay? So that's why the churches have the pointed arch and, uh, and the stained windows got pointed arch. don't have a thing to do with being holy. It's got to do with the womb. And, of course, um, the, as I said, the, the priest wears the long black robe because he's wearing the, the, uh, the garb of a woman. He's wearing the long black robe of the female because all divine wisdom was always assumed to be in the woman, in the female. Peace of Sophia is what the Greeks called it. So anyway, uh, enough of that. We could go on all night only with, with things like Joshua, the son of Nun. In the Hebrew, the word Nun is fish, or Joshua is uh, Jesus, the son of the fish, or Joshua, the son of Nun. And we could talk about... Um, Yahweh Jehovah being a hermaphrodite, which he was. Uh, the God of the Hebrews was both male and female. That's what the uh, Hebrew words for the Tetragrammaton implied, male and female. That's why the Bible says that God made man in his own image, male and female, because God was male and female. And we can get into all kinds of uh, stories. Oh, I, incidentally, did I, I, I think I might have passed this point up, and I'm taking most of the stuff off the top of my head, so I'm trying to remember if I brought this point out about Islam and the IS, uh, ISIS, or dominated. Is Israel. Israel, it right, right. And the, therefore, ISIS and then uh, then with the coming of Akhenaten, as I said, brought in the worship of amun Re or God's son, amun Re, R-A, and then taking that religion and moving into Cana, uh, and in and, and the Palestine area, it be, uh, the the worship that was already in Palestine, ah, yes. already uh, ISIS or dominated is Israel. Israel, it right, right, and the, therefore ISIS, and then uh, then with the coming of Akhenaten, as I said, brought in the worship of Amun Re or God's son, Amun Re, R A, and then taking that religion and moving into Cana. Uh, and in and, and the Palestine area, it be, uh, the the worship that was already in Palestine, already in Jerusalem, was the worship of El. So we join those together: Isis, Re, and El. Israel, and that's where we get the state of Israel, or the or the word Israel, which was a generic word for the worship of God's people. God's people, Israel. It's a generic term that was used for the ancient people of the world who worship God. Israel. Isis, Ray, L. Anyway, once we there's so much we could uh, talk about in in relation to uh, the Bible and all of the things that that are taught in the Bible and why we have seven like the seven candle lampstand and the the twelve tribes of Israel and the 
the 12 uh, brothers of Joseph and the 12 apostles. 12 is a big number in the Bible, and why? Well, it's because of astrology, the 12 signs of the zodiac in the 12 months of the year. And, of course, this, they had the seven candle lampstand. The seven candle lampstand were the seven lights of the ancient world. A candle's a light. It's not a big light. It's a little light. That's why you have seven little lights, which were the seven little lights in the heavens. The seven, uh, the yeah. seven pole stars. That's right. Exactly. The seven great gods of the old ancient world in the, in the heavens. And, of course, today we hear that God is love. No, actually the word is God is Jove, J-O-V-E. Of course, somewhere along the line, the J got changed to an L, and today God is love. But originally it was God is Jove, J-O-V-E. And, of course, our numbering, our system is, and a system of numbering in America is goes to 10. You know, we, we go up to 10 and stop. Well, because 10 is the holy number. 10 is the holy number of God because in the, in the, in the ancient Egyptian, uh, the number of God was I-O, the letter I and an O, I-O. And today we have I-O or 10 as the highest number you can go to. So it had nothing to do with God. It has to do with Egypt. Uh, we talked about the uh, tearing of the holy veil tearing of the holy veil and uh, of the most holy that was the woman's dress the tearing of the veil and the pointed arches as we said so I, I, as I said there's just so much uh, we're not even going to be able to get into but I've got tons of it so there is something now I want to bring up about um, about our culture today and its connection and our cultures and uh, in our country America and its connections with England now, England has what we call a royal family. And, of course, that comes from the original Egyptian uh, di divinities was Isis, uh, or Osiris, and Horus. Osiris the father, Isis the mother, and Horus the son. And in Egypt, those three divinities were called, the original three divinities were called the holy family or the royal family, the royal family. And, of course, today we have the royal family there in England. And that's where, they, that's where their royalty comes from. Their royalty comes from black Africa. But we don't talk about that a whole lot because we don't want to br you know, bring that kind of subject up. But we're going to bring it up tonight because it's about time somebody brings it up, that that royal family in England gets their lineage and their so-called royalty from an actual divinities in Egypt, the royal family. So the fact of the matter is when you strip it all down, you're going to find out there ain't nothing royal about England. Now, I love England, and I love the English people. I'm just telling you what the book says. I'm just telling you what academics will prove if you go to a library. Now, when you understand that uh, England, the, uh, the word Brit, ish, the word Brit uh, means a contract. In Hebrew, the word Brit means a contract or a writ, is a holy writ, or a holy Brit is a holy contract. And the word in Hebrew for man is ish. Therefore, Brit ish is the covenant man or a holy man. That's where we get the idea that the, that the king of England is so holy because he's a British, a covenant man. But that's Hebrew. And then when you find out that this whole idea of the holiness, um, and, and, and believe me, it's a very serious thing because the king of England is considered to be one of the holiest people in the world. Now, when you understand, that's something that, that, you, that you're going to want to watch, is that when Prince Charles is crowned king, the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury will read his initiation rites to the king, to the young Charles, and he will recite those rites back. When he is given those initiation rites to be king, listen to the words that the Archbishop of Canterbury says to that new king. He is saying something, and I'm paraphrasing it because I forgot to bring the document tonight, something to the effect that you are accepting this position of King of England for Jehovah. You're sitting on the throne of David, and this is Jehovah's throne, God's kingdom. Therefore, you are, God, you are the Messiah over the united kingdom, God's united kingdom. Now, when you understand that God's united kingdom, when we're talking about the kingdom of God, and when you understand that the kingdom, of course, goes back to Egypt, now you've got some, you know, you've got some serious problems here. So, you're talking about the Archbishop of Canterbury, and then we get back to the United States government is being ruled from the White House. The House is white. You'll notice that it is not being ruled from the Black House. It's being ruled from the White House. 
And incidentally, the government of, the, of England is ruled from what is called Whitehall. Whitehall. And Whitehall, like our White House, is a symbol of power because the hall is, comes from like the Masonic Hall, the Lodge Hall, the Union Hall. Uh, for Jehovah Witnesses, the Kingdom Hall. And it is the Kingdom. That's because Jehovah's Witnesses are nothing more than, like their brothers, the Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, Christadelphians, uh, Worldwide Church of God, all of those groups are British Israelite Masonic cults organized, directed, and financed by Freemasons of the York Rite class. The York Rite Freemasonry gave birth to the Mormon Church, Seventh-day Adventists, Christadelphians, Jehovah's Witnesses, and a host of other cults and groups which, are, which can be considered to be uh, British Israel Masonic cults who are going about telling everybody that there's going to be a new kingdom and the new world order and white folks are going to rule the world. And, and uh, that's, of course, why blacks are not looked upon very highly in the Mormon church and, or anywhere else in America because it's a white man's country and it has to do with where we come from, from England and God's kingdom and the United Kingdom and, uh, and the kingdom of God that's coming is going to be ruled by white men. So as I said, and this is this is the ideology behind the new world order. Yes, the coming, ideology coming right. through the secret societies, right. taking from the ancient religions and implementing it through the secret societies, through the Christianity, through the various sects. Yes, the the, the like Jehovah's the Witnesses, right, the, the shock, shock troops, troops, preparing and the of world. course the people who are introduced to the religion are giving the outer cover. Yes, right. Of the Jesus right. and, uh, and the, the wonderful holy, story. The wonderful story. Right, as long but as you the, yeah. the What they don't know is just a story, and it's actually being used as a front for a very sinister uh, movement in the world, for world domination. And it don't have a thing to do with holy. It's got to do with politics. Now, if you understand that the old world of Europe was called the old world order, and the old world order was under Rome, so therefore, the old ancient Roman Empire ruled Europe. And with the coming of America, we, we, say, we hear that Christopher Columbus discovered America. He discovered the new world. So America is the new world. Now, if you're Jehovah's Witness looking for the new world, you're in the new world. You know, and Christians are waiting for the new world to come. You are in the new world now. And that's why, again, I go back to Steven Spielberg's movie because they're so great about the, uh, uh, the, the war between the old order and the new order. And, the, and America is, of course, founded in New York. So New York is called the Empire State because this is the state of the new empire, New York. And New York is the Empire State, so it's striking back at the old order, Rome, in, in Europe. So there's this war going on between the powers in Europe, the old dynasties in Europe, the old banking families of the Rothschilds and the old banking families in Europe, as opposed to the newfound uh, white folks in America who are going to rule the world with the new world order. And that's why the United Nations is in New York, because New York is the empire state. And what it amounts to, basically, is that some very powerful families fighting to see who's going to own you. That's all it amounts to, as to who's going to own and control you. It's going to be some of the old-time good old boys back in, in Rome, under the Roman dynasties, under the, under the order of the Acts, and some of those secret societies like th that you will see in Godfather III when Michael Corleone at the beginning is being knighted and the knights of... Uh, don't even remember the Masonic order of knights that he was knighted into in the movie The Third. It wasn't a, was it Knights of Malta? Knights of Malta. Knights of Malta. Knight, exactly. Knights of Malta, and uh, and then when you understand the connection between the Knights of Malta, and the powerful secret societies in Rome, and their animosity and 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 violent animosity toward the founding of the New World Order under Masonic. Uh, new World Philosophies, and of course all the founding fathers in America were either Rosicrucians or Freemasons or, you know, into fraternal orders, and so it all has to do with who's going to rule you. And of course all of the uh, symbols that are used in Christianity are actually Freemasonic symbolism. Oh yes, absolutely, totally. All of the symbols, I mean like the, uh, as we said, the Sheriff Star of David, and on the American president, uh, on, the, on the dollar bill, if you turn the back of a dollar bill over and look on the right-hand side, you'll see the, 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 uh, the eagle. 
Now, I'm just doing this from, from memory. But above the eagle is 13 stars, and those 13 stars are in a configuration of the Star of David, or the six-pointed hexagram. Okay, and around those 13 stars, of course, the 13 comes from the 13 colonies, or the, and that's why 13's unlucky, because it comes from the old ancient worship of 13, which is Jesus, or the Son, and the 12. Jesus and his 12 make 13. That's why 13's an unlucky number. Okay? Right, and this is according to the Jewish Freemasonry. Well, it's according, right? yeah, it's according to, because Freemasonry actually is, an, is in fact, once it's totally disassembled and look at all the parts is Freemasonry is in fact nothing more than eclectic Judaism. It is a form of Judaism which is not Judaism at all. But it is a form of Judaism that uses many of the Judaic symbols and emblems and, and, and emblems and uh, and ensigns. And so it's not actually Jewish, but it is based on the old Kabbalistic Jewish system. But what it is, in fact, uh, and I'm not talking at this point, I'm not talking about the normal, regular uh, Masons that you know, because all the Masons I know are fine people. I'm not talking about the Masons that, that you deal with every day and live next door to. I'm talking about a very secret, occult society that rules this world from behind the scenes. And as I said, don't look at the Mafia for being evil. You better look at the real criminals. The real criminals are the ones you don't even see. You're never, you're never going to see them, hear them, or, or, or have anything to do with them. They are, so, they are so deeply embedded in the ancient world and in the modern day world, you'll never know who they are. As a matter of fact, you can get a taste of that from like uh, JFK, the movie JFK, but that don't even begin to tell the story. And of course, many of the conflicts going on uh, today in the Middle East is uh, having to do with uh, uh, Masonic orders. Uh, I believe the King uh, King Hussein of Jordan. That's right. Is uh, heavily into the Masonic. That's uh, right. And one of the groups is called the the Cedars of Lebanon. That's why we have a we have a hospital here called Cedars of Lebanon. That is a Masonic order in the Middle East. A secret society called the Cedars of Lebanon. It don't have nothing to do with them pretty trees. It has to do with a secret group of men called the Cedars of Lebanon. So basically, I'm not going to go much further because I know we're running out of time. But I have to say that when you understand that the, the fascist symbol was the axe, and of course we got the fasci axe in the in Washington D.C. in the Senate Caucus Room when when you see the president giving the State of the Union message, and and you see it on the on the uh, television every night. You always see the Senate room where the Senate and Congress meet. Look on the walls, you'll see two great big 12, 15 foot high fasci the uh, symbols of, of fascism and it's right there in the in the, in the government in the senate in the senate there are huge fasci symbols hanging on, on the wall which are a bundle of sticks with a hatchet head and they're called fascis with a hatchet head or an axe head and of course that's why in the second world war hitler in italy rome and italy uh and Hit hitler were called the axis powers because of the fascist axe and that goes back to an ancient order of the axe in the Middle Ages and in the early Middle Ages, the order of the axe. So I'm going to I'm going to conclude tonight by saying that the, we we haven't even begun to scrape the surface, and, and we're, we're I fighting wanted with to, time. to to bring up one uh, quick point. Uh, we we are bombarded with uh, Prince Charles, and that we know is part of the yes. Scottish right or York well, right. It's, well, uh, Prince Andrew Bombarded is Duke with, of York. Uh, Prince Charles, and that we know is part of the yes. Scottish Rite or York well, Rite. It's, well, uh, Prince Andrew is Duke of York, so he's the head of the York Rite. And that's why people like Gene Scott who can say he went out and spent three days on, on Prince Andrew's yacht be, uh, because he was specially asked to go out there. And we got a lot of people that were specially asked to go out and spend the, uh, three or four days out on Prince Andrew's yacht because Prince, An Prince Andrew is the Duke of York. And now we're talking about the old York order of York Right Freemasonry and New York, the, the New World Order. So there's some shenanigans going on here that people don't know anything about. And it has to do with secret societies and subversive movements. And of course, uh, the Promethean world revolutionary movements that we approached only from a political standpoint yeah. 
actually have their origin in, in um, secret in societies society. and Freemasonry. Right. So a lot of people are hoodwinked by getting involved Absolutely. only from a political sta revolutionary standpoint. And not realizing who the boss is behind the scenes. And, and a classic example of that, and I'm going to lay this one on you, is, is we've been told for the past 50 years by our so-called news media, our news media been telling us about this boogeyman of Soviet Union is going to get you. And boy, we got to spend $100 billion to protect ourselves from this terrible, evil empire. And now we come to find out the evil empire was like the Wizard of Oz, the old man behind the curtain, and, and the people starving over there. They don't even have a, a, a apples to eat, and they're going to be an evil empire. Somebody has been manipulating our press so that we can make money, because remember, war is good business if you want to invest your son. So somebody is using us, manipulating us, and sending us to, have, to a blessing to some more bloodshed. And you better find out how come it is that the Pope, the Roman Pope, has never been in England, never, ever been in England, and ain't never going to go to England. Because when you understand the connection between England and America and the New World Order and Rome and the old Europe under the old World Order, then you're going to find out why the Pope has never been to England and there's some real serious stuff here that we haven't got into that we ought to get into another time. Well, certainly. We look forward to uh, uh, getting in uh, into this another time. We had to take this approach in order to lay this out so that people can have uh, a background for what will we come back and do another segment of this uh, presentation because we're going to get into the fraternal orders of banks. Oh, yeah. The whole banking oh, yeah. uh, system set out through the world, uh, they themselves are, are part and parcel of secret societies. And how they were set up in the year 1099. That's why in your income tax you got a 1099 form because in the year 1099 those people were setting up some business. And that's where it comes from. Exactly. Where can people get more information directly from you? Yeah, I was going to say, the best place to get more information is talk to me. <laughs> so you can and give them uh, my do address. You, do you or, have an, uh, a number? Yes, I'll tell you what. Uh, just have them call or give them the address. I think the address would be better. Okay. Because I'm so very seldom ever in the office. Uh, uh, they can write to you at uh, Jordan Maxwell. Correct. At 249 North Brand Boulevard. 249 That's North brand B R A N D Correct. Boulevard, Suit 362. Yep, Suite 362. Glendale, California. Correct. And that's 91203. Correct. And you might want to give them the phone number if they want. Phone number is area code 818 507 4915. Area code 818 507 49 one five. Uh, we still have just a few more minutes. Uh, we can uh, just close with something uh, you, you can bring up, well, Wellington. Or <clears throat> yeah, I was going to say, okay, here's, uh, here's something I think that's uh, interesting. Uh, we were talking about at the beginning, um, I, I like what R William Randolph Hearst said, and I wanted to bring this up. William Randolph Hearst, the American newspaper publisher, said, any man who has the brains to think and the nerve to act for the benefit of the people of the country is always considered a radical by those who are content with stagnation and willing to endure their own disaster. I am not willing to endure my own disaster. So the things that we see coming down with the AIDS, and of course AIDS being a blood-borne disease, yes. and this whole secret society thing, going back into those ancient belief systems, the, bl the blessing, That's right. they are giving blood. us the blessing. Yeah, in your blood. And this is the ideology behind this whole process. It's not just all of a sudden they just come out with AIDS, but it is connected to there's an ideology behind ancient old behind ideology. It. Right. And of course we will uh, get into that more. As we uh, go on, we will come back again and uh, so that we can get more. And is there any other areas that uh, we needed to well, uh, touch uh, on? Yes. As a matter of fact, I want to touch on this one thing I think is very interesting. In 1953, now this might give you an idea about, w about what's going on here. 1953, in the fall of 1953, Norman Dobb was director of research for the Reese Committee. And the Reese Committee was set up to investigate the foundations, those fine, admirable foundations like the Rockefeller Foundation and the, and the Warburg Foundation, all them uh, back east foundations that got them hundreds of billions of dollars that we don't know nothing about. And they are always giving that money to poor folks to take care of everybody. So there was a, 
there was a research uh, committee put together in 1953 in the fall of 53 in which Norman Dobb was the director of research for the Reese Committee investigating the, uh, the uh, major uh, foundations, okay? And according to uh, the, the record, uh, a man named H. Roland Gaithier, who was the president of the Ford Foundation, uh, met with uh, Norman Dodd and told Norman Dodd this. He said, Mr. Dodd, quote, Mr. Dodd, all of us here at the policy-making level have had experience either in the OSS or with the European Economic Administration with directives from the White House. We operate here today under those directives from the White House. Now, when he was asked by Norman Dodd, then Mr. Gaither, what directives have you been operating under? He said, quote, the substance of those directives were that we shall use our grant-making powers in those private uh, foundations. We shall use our grant-making powers to so alter our life in the United States so that we can be comfortably merged with the Soviet Union in the near future. Is there something going on here that we don't know about this new world order? Certainly. Uh, this has been a, an eye-opener certainly and we need to we just we we just scratch the surface there's plenty more of material that we could have gone in it was it, once plenty. again important to kind of lay out a foundation and we can go into uh you mentioned uh another Freemasonic movement. Uh, well, I wanted to get in next time, if we can, uh, on the sun, the use of the sun in symbols of revolutionary movements and, and uh, flags and, yeah, and flags and, and cults like that. And all of those different uh, sun symbols come back to God's sun. And, uh, and now we get into Kabbalistic Kabbalah, uh, the Kabbalistic use of the sun and the uh, Messianic age, the new age, which is coming. And it has to do with all kinds of interesting things. But in, um, in concluding my, my, my part tonight, I would like to say thank you to, again, for, to KPFK, and I would like to advise the audience to understand that, that what we're not doing is we're not, we're not trying to uh, put down anyone's faith or religion. What we're trying to do is get to the bottom of what we're having to deal with in the world today. And if whatever it is that we believe is not true, then we had better find out about it and get to the bottom because we are all on this planet together and if we're, and we're a part of something that isn't true, it would behoove us to find out about it now. That's what I'm hoping to be able to do. And we look forward to coming back because this is something that, this is a topic where we will be discussing at length and we look forward to uh, going deeper into this and that will close out this.